I want to tell you about randomness. Uh, it's, uh, I really like talking about randomness because uh, it doesn't matter almost where uh, people come from, what, what is their background, and it doesn't have to be scientific. People in the streets, everybody has some notion of you know, what randomness means in general and for them. You know, it can be just thinking about you know, what is uh, luck and what is chance and uh, fortune, and uh, they think about you know, the un unpredictability of events. Uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, randomness was formally studied by uh, lots of scientists, definitely physicists studied entropy and randomness, and then mathematicians gave various definitions of, uh, of, uh, what, of randomness. Uh, it could be information theorists, dy dynamical systems people, probabilists, of course, statisticians, and so on. Uh, and uh, when Russ said that uh, mass changes everything, I was thinking that uh, I could add to it that uh, the computational lens changes it again. So I want to tell you today about the point of view of randomness that comes from think of it, thinking of it computationally. Uh, those who uh, read the abstract for the talk, uh, I asked whether the world is uh, random or deterministic. I don't know. I'm not going to answer this. But I'll tell you lots of other fun things. So let's, let's start. First, I want to, you know, just a simple background is that we are going to talk now only about discrete uh, probability. OK, so the basic, you know, uh, random event is that of a coin toss, a perfect coin toss, which lands heads with probability half and tails with probability half. And we have a sequence of these which are independent. And uh, just to make sure you are with me, here are two uh, tosses of 20 coins like this. Uh, which one is more likely? <laughs> All right. Good. So uh, they're equally likely. It's a uniform distribution. And uh, that's, that's all we need to know. This distribution, sometimes it's called the uniform distribution of a sequences of some fixed length, uh, distribution of full entropy. And uh, that's what we'll work with. So now we are going to, you know, the first, you know, half of the first part of the talk is going to show that, uh, just to give a list of examples, some of them you know, of the amazing utility of having such sequences of coin tosses, perfect coin tosses. It's really immensely powerful, and I'll give some uh, examples from different fields. And then uh, the next question to ask is whether all these applications, wonderful applications, are real or just figments of our imagination. Do we have these perfect coin tosses? So then, uh, to answer this, I'll, I'll uh, define and uh, exemplify the idea of pseudo-randomness. It's basically the deterministic structures of various types that share some properties of random ones. Okay, and we'll talk about that we'll see examples and applications. And, uh, uh huh. You're all going to miss the last. So that's as, as low as it can go. Well, if anybody in the back can lift the slide a little bit, it would be nicer. Uh, I want to, I will get to the main point and uh, tell you about, you know, which of these wonderful applications survive a world in which maybe the randomness is not quite so nice, uh, independent coin tosses. Uh, maybe it's weaker, or maybe the world is deterministic. Uh, what happens? Do we lose everything that we could do with them? And uh, it will be an optimistic answer. So anyway, we'll get there. So first, I want to start with the examples, uh, the remarkable utility of randomness. And uh, in every slide, you'll see this uh, figure reminding you to think, uh, to have in the back of your mind that we, you know, do we have this uh, perfect randomness available? So the first example is the most familiar, uh, the most familiar, uh, that of sampling. Uh, suppose you want to know what will be the results of the next election, let's say in the U.S., and uh, people are voting red or blue, whatever the colors mean. And uh, you know, how do you go about it? Well, uh, one really efficient way, as you all know, is uh, to just sample a bunch of people and ask them what they vote. And if the sample has size 2,000, and it's really random, you know, it's uh, uniformly chosen from all possible subsets of 2,000, then the following theorem holds, that with 
very high probability, 99%, the fraction of red dots in a sample will be within 2% of the fraction of red dots in the whole population. Okay, so this is uh, the law of large numbers. Uh, it's one of the most important and useful results in mathematics. And uh, it's even more powerful than it seems, uh, you know, there are several numbers on the slide, but this number, the, the size of the population, doesn't matter for this theorem to hold. 2,000 is just, just depend on these two numbers. So the same theorem would hold even if we were uh, having an election in China or even if we asked every star of the universe to vote. So it's a very powerful, uh, you know, way of using randomness, and of course, if we wanted to deterministically find out uh, you know, the fraction who will vote red uh, in the population, we'd have, well, let's say within 2%, we will have to ask something like 98% uh, of them, which is uh, impossible. So uh, that's, that's the first and most basic application. Now I'll move to more sophisticated ones and more recent ones. And uh, OK, so here's uh, actually a family of uh, applications. These are efficient probabilistic algorithms. Efficient means that uh, these are programs that run very fast, so they can, uh, uh, you know, they, they give us the answer within seconds. And what is this particular problem that uh, is the example here? I give you a region in space. It could be square or, but it could be of any shape. Uh, a region in space, and I ask you, this presents a particular tiling by dominoes. And the question is, in such a region, how many different uh, tilings exist? Estimate this number. Uh, this turns out to be a basic, to represent a basic problem in statistical physics. Uh, the Daimler problem, it uh, captures uh, thermodynamic properties of the material that you're working with. And as it turns out, uh, this theorem, uh, Jerome Sicler Vigoda, uh, they devise an efficient probabilistic algorithm that approximates the number of uh, such tilings. So they solve this fundamental problem uh, using what's called the Monte Carlo method. And the point here is that in such a region, even, even if it's small, even if it's a uh, thousand by thousand, the number of potential tilings is exponential in the size of the, uh, in the area of this uh, shape. So uh, you can just go about trying them all. Exponential time is infeasible, it's like infinity. So if you don't have randomness, we have no idea how to access this problem. If you do have randomness, then they you know, devise a probabilistic algorithm that's efficient, that runs fast and uh, terminates quickly and gives us uh, the answer. And this uh, example is really one of many. I should say, by the way, that uh, the, the fact that the best way, you know, uh, you know, counting every possible uh, such dimer configuration is the best algorithm we currently have. Maybe there is a better algorithm, better deterministic algorithm. We don't know, and we'll come back to this. But anyway, there are lots of examples like this. Let me give you a few more uh, uh, mathematical examples. So here are some examples of other problems, completely different problems for which having randomness makes the difference between you know, feasibility and infeasibility. In number theory, uh, it's the problem of finding a large prime, finding, you give me a thousand digit prime is such a problem. In algebra, uh, factoring polynomials in many variables. Geometry, estimating the volume of uh, convex sets in very high dimensions. Uh, in analysis, uh, computing large Fourier coefficients of, again, functions in many variables. These are just examples, and uh, of course, there are lots and lots of other examples in, uh, in optimization, computer science, and uh, uh, other areas. So, in, in, in all of these, we have fast probabilistic algorithms, but the best known deterministic algorithms require exponential time. So, that's uh, one different demonstration of the power of randomness uh, in all these examples. So let's move to something else. This is a very different setting where randomness helps. This is a setting that's uh, uh, 
goes under the name distributed asynchronous computation. This is a situation where not one computer is trying to solve a problem, but many, many people or many agents or machines together are trying to uh, solve a problem. And moreover, there is no universal clock that they uh, uh, can work with. They each have their own clock, and maybe you know, the messages they send each other are sort of uh, arbitrarily delayed. And so in this setting, there are lots of very basic problems. Of course, it came out from uh, real computer system questions. Uh, I'm not going to explain these uh, problems in detail. Uh, one problem is uh, they have great names, these guys, for their problems. The dining philosopher's problem is basically a problem of resource allocation uh, in distributed environment. Uh, the basic theorem, uh, there is a there is no deterministic solution. Solution is just programs for the, for the participating agents so that they will be able to all you know, get the resources they like within you know, a finite amount of time. Uh, there is no deterministic solution at all. Here it's between possibility and complete impossibility. Whereas uh, probabilistically, if they are random, uh, allowed to randomize, then, uh, you know, then it becomes feasible. And similarly, the Byzantine generals problem, which is a different problem, it's about coordination in the presence of faults. We have a theorem saying that there is no deterministic solution at all. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, if you allow randomness, again, are, you, can, you can have publicistic programs for the agents that will, will solve the problem. Um, OK, so that's the distributed uh, setting. Now, the examples I gave so far are uh, examples of things you want to do, and randomness helps doing them, makes them faster or makes them possible. Uh, it turns out that randomness is also very essential to just getting the right definitions of various uh, mathematical notions. And so let me give you two examples of this. By the way, please uh, stop with questions if you, if you have any. OK. Let me switch again uh, to the area of game theory. Game theory is uh, an area of math and economics that is uh, studying rational behavior. What would people do in strategic situations? So this is a particular strategic situation. It's called the chicken game uh, of Aumann. The way they describe these games, uh, economists, is uh, game theorists, is by, uh, by a matrix. In this case, there are two players, and uh, uh, one plays the rows and one plays the columns, and each of them in this example have two strategies, either be aggressive or cautious. This was supposed to capture the situation of, uh, you know, two macho young drivers driving uh, towards each other and, you know, who will swerve to the side first. So, and uh, what's in the matrix is two numbers represent the, the payoff to each it's one of them. I, I think this should have been minus infinity, minus infinity, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, we'll stick with that. And uh, okay, good. So, how do you understand strategic situation? What what is what is rational behavior for these drivers in this you know given these payoffs? Uh, this was answer the uh, very important and uh, to this day uh, answer is uh, what John Nash discovered Nash equilibrium. Uh, a set of strategies is rational in this definition, if when I know what the others are going to do, then I have no reason to deviate from my own strategy. So it's sort of a stability definition. So that's great. Of course, uh, he didn't get the uh, Nobel Prize just for defining it. He also, you know, you can ask, OK, good, that's a nice definition. Which games have this proper, have such rational solutions, the Nash equilibria? And he proved. He proved that every game, every game, no matter how many players, no matter how many strategies each player has, there is always an Ash equilibrium. However, this theorem is true only if you allow randomness, only if the strategies that players can play are mix, are a mix of their basic strategies. So here, for example, in this, uh, in this chicken game, it turns out that there is a unique uh, Nash equilibrium, and there's, uh, you know, these are the probabilities of playing each uh, for both players. This holds for every game. And if you don't have randomness, if you just had the, the same definition but deterministically, then in fact most games have no 
equilibrium. In particular, this one doesn't. So randomness here plays uh, you know, an essential role in just having the right, the correct definition of uh, a very basic object, rational behavior. An even more familiar example is cryptography. I mean, in cryptography, there's basically nothing you can do if you don't have random. You cannot define anything. The very notion of a secret, that's where everything started from, Shannon, uh, father of information theory, uh, says basically a secret is just as good as the amount of entropy, amount of randomness in it. I mean, if you pick, a, let's say, a nine-digit uh, uh, password, if you pick it randomly, then my chances of guessing it is, uh, you know, one over a billion. If you pick it, uh, you know, just from the list of phone numbers of your friends, even if it's Facebook friends and you have many, uh, I would still have a much better chance of guessing it. So it's just uh, about how much randomness you have. And uh, a secret is just uh, undefinable in a reasonable way if you don't allow randomness. And of course, this goes for all the more sophisticated uh, uh, notions of cryptography, public uh, key encryption, uh, digital signatures, zero knowledge proofs, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. All of them require randomness, and without them, we wouldn't have this, uh, this field. And of course, all uses, all systems, cryptographic systems, use uh, randomness. Uh, OK, so again, we need it uh, here as well. And I could go on. There are lots of other the uses of randomness that are even more ancient than this example. And uh, we see that, uh, yeah, I think by now I'm, I'm assuming I convince you that randomness is good. Perfect randomness is good. Uh, OK, great. So uh, now let's try to answer this question, uh, you know, where are these uh, random bits coming from? And uh, my way of answering questions I have no idea about, which I assume is your way too, is to ask Google. So I, I ask Google. Uh, I asked, I put uh, two random bits here, and uh, you know, what do you get? Well, you get close to four million answers here. And uh, you flip through them, you see that these are just names of companies who sell you random bits. That's where you get them, you buy them, okay? Uh, so that's interesting, because then you wonder uh, what, what uh, you know, how do they get there? Or what do they tell you about the, the way they get their random bits? And actually, it's really interesting because they use different things. This one uses radioactive decay, uh, this atmospheric noise, and the, the last two use the sort of quantum phenomena. And uh, you, can, you can read more and try to get convinced uh, uh, that they are good for you, you know, that they are really random. Uh, I actually wondered, one of the, once I saw this, uh, I was uh, wondering what, you know, does anybody buy? Random bits. I don't know personally anyone who buys uh, <laughs> random bits, but it turns out that this company here, Quantis, they, they sell quite a lot. Do you know, uh, you know who, who are the customers? It's not uh, cheap. It's maybe $1,000 for a box or something. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, anybody who would be, yeah. How many are in a box? <laughs> well, uh, an infinity, yeah. So it turns out that casinos, by this, uh, maybe they want to convince uh, their customers that, you know, I don't know, uh, they are not cheating. But uh, I mean, even if I gave you such a device, I mean, it's a sort of a serious question. How can you tell that it does what it should, even if you know whoever built it was honest? So anyway, we'll get to this too. Uh, but uh, we see that uh, lots of these uh, uh, systems somehow use what we believe about the world, that there is some random or unpredictable phenomena about uh, you know, uh, the weather or something, uh, all sorts of all these uh, phenomena and others. And we can just tape, um, uh, what do you call tape it, or uh, you know, just sample this phenomena and just get from them your, uh, your uh, random bits somehow. Uh, and the question is, uh, you know, how can you tell whether it's good enough for whatever application we've seen before? Okay. So let's, uh, in order to, to sort of uh, discuss it, 
we are going to define uh, randomness or pseudo randomness. And uh, in order to do that, I, uh, I will have an experiment. So I need a volunteer. <coughs> I think that Mark is probably a good volunteer. You don't have to, yeah, I'm not going to cut you up. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I just, you can sit and relax and just answer three questions. Okay, so this is the most important slide in my talk. This is the time to wake up and, uh, okay, so here's, here's uh, this uh, experiment that I'll repeat three times. And uh, this is me here. And this is uh, Mark, okay? Uh, and uh, here's what I'm asking you to do. So what I'm, I have a, a coin here and I'm tossing it and just as it leaves my finger, you are supposed to tell me what it will be when it lands on the ground, okay? I'm actually not going to do it. I'm just going to ask you, what do you, how do you estimate your chances of guessing correctly, okay? So, uh, I'm tossing the coin, and what do you think is the probability you'll get it right? Yeah, no, it's a perfect coin, and I'm not cheating. It's, yeah, yeah, assuming that. Okay, a half, okay. Yeah, I agree. So that's the first question. Uh, I chose well my uh, victim here. Uh, all right, so let, let's change the experiment now, okay? Uh, I'm going to, I mean, the, I'm going to toss my coins before and ask Mark to uh, guess it just as it leaves my finger, but I'm going to help him. I'm going to give him a, a laptop. Okay, so you have a laptop in your lap. What do you think are the chances you'll get uh, the coin toss correctly <laughs> as it lands on the floor? Windows or Apple? Yeah, <laughs> in fact, <laughs> peak. <laughs> You can, well, you can take my laptop. <laughs> it's a Mac. It's still a half. All right, I agree. I think most people will agree. Well, what can a laptop do? I mean, uh, uh, in this, you know, it's, it's a second till it lands on the floor. All right, so let's change the experiment yet again. And now I'm going to give Mark, you know, I'm going to plant video cameras all around the room, all trained on my finger, and they're all connected to a Cray computer, and all this Cray computer machinery is connected to Mark's laptop, okay? And now as it leaves my finger, you uh, should guess what it will be when it lands on the floor. What do you think the chances you'll be able to do it? So do I get to see a little bit of it? Yeah, yeah, you, are, you get to see like, uh, yeah. One third of a second. Um, all right, I, let's say two thirds. Okay, so actually, and I heard somebody said 99% there, and I, I agree, all these answers are good. The main point is that it's very different than a half. Uh, I think it will be with, uh, with the right technology, I think it will be one, but it doesn't matter if it's, uh, it's two sides significantly different than a half. So what, what's, what's the point of this, uh, you know, uh, slide or this amazing, you know, description uh, in the paper of Blum and Michali? Uh, the point is the following. So I think till uh, computer science got involved, whatever definition people gave to randomness was always objective. It was a property of the phenomena. But no, the, the phenomena here is a coin toss. It didn't change in all three experiments. And nevertheless, you know, it's predictability, which is uh, what we really care about if we are using, you know, uh, random bits in, in whatever application we talked about, changed completely with the computational power of the observer. So randomness sort of in the computational power of the beholder. And that's the main message. And this is a subjective, it's not an objective definition, it's a subjective definition. And that's what we'll work with. So now we are going to work with this, uh, you know, with the idea of this definition, okay? We care about what the observer is going to do, what, what kind of properties of the event it's going to measure or test. So, so the randomness, I'll, I'll give examples, but let me give sort of a high level uh, definition of uh, so what you'll see is that pseudo randomness is not just one property, it's a collection of properties. And it depends really on the application, which one you use. 
a very high level, we'll study deterministic structures. These are, you know, can be numbers or graphs or tables or works or, you know, various structures. We'll have a universe of these. And the pseudo-random property, you know, will be what is a random-like property. A random-like property is simply a property which is shared by most of them. So it's just a large subset of this space, a very, you know, something that contains almost all points. So almost all points in this space are in P. Of course, there are many things that are almost everything. Uh, so this particular P is what this application or observer will test. And we'll, we'll see examples. I just want to say that this is a fantastic uh, area between uh, computer science and mathematics. And uh, w w where there's lots of interaction and growing amount of interaction. Uh, the approach from both fields is somewhat different. Usually in math, uh, people study random-like properties of you know, natural objects, natural mathematical objects. They ask whether particular structures have the property. It's particular pseudo-random property. And computer science is uh, more about uh, can we just efficiently find an object that has pseudo-random property. This is sort of a curious uh, thing if you think about the fact that the, this, uh, almost everything is pseudo-random. You sort of, uh, you know, you want to find an element in this set. It's more like, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> in the words of uh, Howard Karloff, it's uh, like finding hay in a haystack. It turns out that this is a non-trivial problem. It, uh, it may be the case that you are presented with a haystack and uh, <laughs> you, you pick up things and they're all needles. So, <laughs> in fact, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a basic problem we'd like to uh, you know, resolve, how to find hay. So, uh, at any rate, this is a great uh, collaborative uh, area of uh, math and CS. So let me now give you some examples of pseudo-random properties. So, uh, the simplest I could think of is that of a normal number. So I think you probably all recognize this 3.1. Four, one, five, nine. Yeah. Uh, so I have an infinite decimal, uh, a real number, and I want to tell you when it is pseudo-random in this sense. When, it, when is it normal? So to define normality, you just want the number to satisfy a collection of conditions. What conditions? Every digit should occur you know, in the limit the same number of times. Every pair, pair of digits should occur you know, the same number of times, so one-tenth, one-hundredth, every three digits should occur one thousand of the time, and so on for every, for every pattern length, okay? So it must satisfy all these conditions, and not only that, it must satisfy them base 10, base 2, and in every base, all right? If it passes all these tests, then we call it uh, normal. Okay, so that's a definition. It turns out that this is being normal is a pseudo-random property. Borel, who defined it, also proved that a random real number, let's say between 0 and 1, according to the Lebesgue measure, is, is normal. So almost every real number is normal. And what's the problem now? The problems we listed in the previous slide, you can ask. Uh, you know, for example, the number pi, is it normal? Or, you know, other, other natural mathematical constants. We don't know. We don't know a single natural mathematical constant uh, that is normal. We do know, uh, it's, it's really interesting, we have, a, we have algorithms to generate the, let's say, the expansion of, uh, of, of normal numbers. In fact, uh, I recently learned that we can do it efficiently even. We can generate this in such a way that uh, producing the nth digit is, uh, happens in polynomial time in n. But anyway, uh, the main purpose of this was to just introduce the idea of a pseudo-random property, simply a property that holds for almost every object in our space. Here, the objects were the real numbers between zero and one. Normal numbers, I don't think it's a, it's a major mathematical area. I don't know too many people who are just uh, working on this. Uh, so it may seem somewhat esoteric, this pseudo-random property. The next thing I want to convince you of is that pseudo-random properties lie in the very heart of the, you know, major problems in mathematics and in computer science, okay? So I want to show you some. Now, for the students here, you know, how do you know if a problem is major, is important? 
It's very important for you, right? I mean, you are choosing them for your thesis, and you are, uh, how do you know? Uh, nobody volunteered? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right on the money. I'd say it's money. Uh, well, <laughs> it's not the only <laughs> criterion, but uh, some, some problems, you know, uh, have a big reward on their head, right? In particular, these uh, clay millennium problems uh, have a $1 million prize for the solution. Of course, if you think that that's a good way to make money, you should uh, act fast because uh, they, they are, at least some of, <laughs> some of them are solved. Uh, what I want to sort of sh show you is that of these seven uh, problems, at least two are problems about pseudo-randomness. It may not be the way you always thought about them, but there are problems about pseudo-randomness, and I'll explain this. These are the previous SMP question and the uh, Riemann hypothesis. Uh, so the, the, I would say that's a major problem of computer science and mathematics, but uh, just to make sure it is a major problem of uh, mathematics. Uh, how are the problems about pseudo-randomness? Well, this one, the pivot SMP question uh, talks about the following pseudo-randomness definition. Random functions, random Boolean functions, say, are hard to compute. So almost all functions, almost all Boolean functions are hard to compute. That makes being hard to compute a pseudo-random property. And now the question is, here is a natural object in this space. Let's say the traveling salesman problem or the satisfiability problem. Uh, uh, some natural object in this space, is it pseudo-random? Does, does it, you know, is it hard to compute? So that's completely analogous to asking whether pi is normal. Okay. We don't know. That's the essence of this problem, just finding whether a particular natural object has this particular pseudo-random property. I'll not elaborate on this, but I'll uh, uh, tell you a little more how the Riemann hypothesis is a pseudo-random uh, property, but before, and I'm just curious, how many people can uh, formulate mathematically the Riemann hypothesis? Yeah. All right, that's a great audience. So about a quarter of you can actually formulate mathematically the, the Riemann hypothesis. And uh, in five minutes, all of you will be able to mathematically formulate the Riemann hypothesis, maybe not to solve it, but... Uh, <laughs> And not only will, will you be able to do this, you will be able to explain it to your friends and family members and uh, everybody, because in this language of pseudo-randomness, it's extremely simple to describe. So uh, I'll elaborate on this, so this pseudo-random property, so let's go to it. So before that, I have to... <laughs> you can have my watch still <laughs> at the end of... <laughs> um, I want to tell you about the random walk or the drunkard's walk. So what's this, uh, this object? Again, we need a universe of objects. These objects will be walks. And the drunkard's walk is, uh, you should imagine that there is uh, a pub here in point zero, and uh, somebody walks into the bar, and the, the joke starts, uh, has a few beers, and comes out and starts walking up and down the street. Uh, and uh, we can even, okay. Work. So it's a sort of plus one with probability half, minus one with probability half. I uh, ran, you know, 10 experiments of what, you know, random simulations of this process for 100 steps. Okay, so the guy walks 100 steps and uh, did it uh, 10 times. And what is striking, uh, especially for people who have never seen this before, is that despite the fact that this guy is walking for 100 steps, he, he remains within 10 or 15 uh, steps away from the pub, uh, despite being going randomly. And, uh, you know, of course, mathematically, it's a very simple property to prove. You can prove that almost surely, almost all walks, after n steps, they remain roughly within square root n distance of the place they start with. So that's a, you know, it's a theorem. It's a very simple theorem to prove. But for us, what it says is that you know, for a walk to remain sort of homebound, close to the origin with the square root uh, of the number of steps, is a pseudo-random property because most walks have this property. Okay, good. So now let's study a particular walk. 
particular deterministic work. So again, this will be like pi and like uh, the traveling salesman <laughs> problem. Uh, for this, let me define for an integer x as p of x is a number of distinct prime divisors of x. And uh, then we define the Mebius function. Uh, it's defined, you know, it's either 0 or plus minus 1. It's 0 if x has a, a square divisor, so sometimes it's 0. But otherwise, you know, if the, all the divisors occur once, then it's 1 if it's even, the number of divisors, and minus 1 if it's odd, a particular number theoretic function. And this number theoretic function can, uh, you know, uh, give us, define for us a work. We simply list all the integers, right? And for each integer, it's plus or minus one. So, you know, at the sort of time t, it tells the worker whether to go up or down. It turns out that sometimes it stays in place, but that happens, happens just a constant fraction of the time. So let's say, think of this sometimes called lazy random work. So you either stay in place or you go up and down. Okay, so it's a deterministic work. We can wonder whether it has a pseudo-random property we talked about. And it's, a, it's an old theorem that the following two statements are equivalent. One is that this work stays close to the origin. Okay, so the sum of these uh, numbers and, uh, you know, for any n remains within uh, roughly square root n of the origin. The sum is about square root n. And the equivalent statement is the Riemann hypothesis. So again, the Riemann hypothesis is just a statement that this particular simple work stays close to the origin. All right. Uh, so we saw two major problems expressed in the language of, uh, of uh, pseudo-randomness with different pseudo-random properties. Yes, question. Yeah, yeah, so uh, it's very important. It's very important. I just was saving on a small print. Of course, yeah. So uh, I, I am a great believer in putting false statements on, uh, on slides, especially popular lectures. But for those of you who want the exact statement, uh, what it should really say is that uh, this being close to the origin is really being within not square root n, but n to the half plus epsilon for every epsilon. So 0.51 or 0.5001 and so on. If it holds for all of these, then that's equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. But you know, it remains a statement about the pseudo-randomness uh, property. OK, so now I want to move to the last uh, part of my talk. Are there any questions so far? All right. Uh, I want to talk about the, the question we started with, uh, about coping, uh, you know, having all these wonderful applications of perfect randomness when we don't have perfect randomness. So here are the possible worlds. So this is the world under which we analyze all our applications. We assume we have perfect randomness. But uh, maybe, you know, we don't. Maybe we just have some, you know, access to some uh, physical phenomena which we can sample and it produces some entropy but in some not so useful form maybe it's, a, it's a, you know we sample and it's a collection of biased and uh, dependent bits for example if we sample the weather every day let's say uh, it's pretty clear that uh, you know it's not independent uh, the best guess for the you know tomorrow tomorrow's uh, you know weather is uh, what, what what it was today so there are correlations in this uh, in these things, uh, uh, and uh, but you know maybe we can use it. Maybe somehow you know uh, improve their quality or something like that, and use them. And uh, you know, sort of the most uh, uh, tough situation is maybe you know the world is uh, deterministic. All coin tosses were tossed in the Big Bang, and everything else is. Uh, Deterministic, can we run our applications? Can we you know, uh, get what we want of all these publicistic algorithms and other uh, applications? So it turns out that, uh, well, OK, so here we, you know, just what we saw. It turns out that we can get a lot, almost everything, in, in both of these cases. So let me explain. 
Uh, I, will, I will do it very briefly. These are sort of major, uh, really major development, both of them, are sort of uh, major developments within complexity theory that uh, happened in the last uh, you know, 25 or 30 years. Uh, so I will not do them justice, I'll just summarize them. So it turns out that with re weak random sources, uh, you know, everything in my examples that were algorithms, algorithms that were, uh, you know, run, run by machines, so not the distributed computation one, for example, all of them can be carried out even if your, your random source is really lousy, really, really lousy, turns out. This is, uh, uh, goes under the, the name extractor theory, or randomness extraction theory, and uh, the idea which I'll demonstrate a simple case of, is that uh, there is a way to enhance some, somehow uh, weak random sources. There is a way to uh, extract the entropy out and make it into a, into a source like this. So uh, the culmination of this a few years ago says that you can do it uh, extremely efficiently and therefore you don't need uh, perfect randomness, you know, very weak randomness suffices. Okay, so that's one uh, setting. The second setting is, uh, you know, the world is deterministic. What can we do then? And it turns out that still we can do a lot. In fact, still you might say it's almost everything we can think of because uh, we can uh, still carry out somehow all efficient probabilistic algorithms. We can uh, do them despite the fact that they are probabilistic algorithms and we have no access to randomness. And I would say efficient is not a restriction because everything we do anyway is, uh, you know, run things that terminate quickly. So this, uh, the, the um, slogan here is hardness versus randomness. This actually uh, comes with an assumption. This, uh, where is this? Oops, yeah. Uh, this comes with an, an, an assumption so hardness versus randomness, uh, this paradigm says that you can take a hard problem, let's say, you can, if, you, if you assume or know that the traveling salesman problem is really hard, it's really exponentially hard, you immediately get out of this that every probabilistic algorithm, those that I showed you and those that I didn't and those who were never invented yet, uh, all these efficient probabilistic algorithms can be, you know, they have deterministic counterparts. The, to each one, there is another one which does not use randomness and actually has no error which delivers uh, efficiently the, the answer. So that's another remarkable development and that's, uh, you know, I'm not going to explain more about this. Uh, so in both cases, somehow we, we see that uh, lots of the applications of perfect randomness survive uh, much worse scenarios. And I want to demonstrate, uh, you know, all of, all, all of these results require different notions of pseudo-random objects, uh, like the ones we saw before, but tailored to these uh, applications. I want to show you one example of a, a special case of this problem and see what kind of uh, pseudo-random property is used there, okay? So... I'm just back to uh, the, the story. We have all these applications which work perfectly with the uh, unbiased independent bits. And the reality is, let's say, that uh, you know, we have some, some phenomena in real life sunspots or stock market behavior, radioactive decay, that uh, generates some unpredictable uh, sequences for us, but they are dependent and correlated <coughs> and biased. And uh, we want to somehow generate from them perfect randomness. So for this, I will assume, uh, this is, it's a simple case in that we will assume that there are these sources, these different sources are independent. We assume we have access to a few completely independent sources of very weak randomness. So I think the assumption somehow, uh, some people believe that the stock market is influenced by some spots, but uh, we will assume it's not. Okay, so what can you do with uh, uh, such few uh, sources? I'm not defining what, what weak randomness is, but you can imagine that there are n bits, a distribution on n bits, where uh, maybe only square root of n of them are somewhat random. They were tossed with probability, you know, 0 0.99, 0 0.1, and they are somewhere you, you have no idea where. 
things like that. So you have a lot of entropy, some non-negligible entropy, but you don't know where it is. And turning this uh, 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 low quality randomness into perfect quality randomness is extractor theory, and we'll do it in the case of independent sources. So let me tell you about what pseudo-random property is needed for that. And it turns out to be a pseudo-random property of tables. We've done graphs, we, uh, sorry, we've done walks, we've done uh, numbers, we've done functions. Now we have, you know, tables, matrices. Uh, think of n by n, n by n matrices of, uh, uh, with entries between one and n. Okay, so this is a random table, as random as I could generate. Uh, so what, what is the property? Well, the property is that we are going to look at a window within this matrix, like a window, a k by k window, and count how many different entries we see in this table, okay? And uh, we'll do it, we, you know, so again, like, be, like with the normal numbers, the property will, uh, you know, will be satisfying uh, something for each one of these windows. And by the way, a window, I mean just a Cartesian product of k rows and k columns. It doesn't have to be contiguous. So it's a simple theorem to prove that in a random matrix, every small window will have lots, will be rich with lots of different entries. Okay. Uh, lots, what do I mean by lots? I mean super linear numbers. So if I look at k by k windows, I want there to be some like k to the 1.1. So more than linear. It will be at most quadratic. I just want that it will be more than linear. Okay, so we have this uh, theorem, which means that this is a pseudo-random property. Almost every table has this property. It satisfies that every small window is rich. Okay, you think of k being, I don't know, root 10, or cube root of n or something. So it is a pseudo-random property, and now we can ask our usual question, you know, uh, give me a, Give me a pseudo-random object in this world. Okay. So is it possible to construct such tables with this property deterministically and efficiently? So when you are, you know, if you are asked, you know, we were faced with this problem and, uh, and uh, you know, what sources of tables do we have? Well, I mean, if you are a serious mathematician, you remember all your education and you remember that the first table you ever saw was this addition table which you learned in second grade or something. And uh, is it a good table? Is it pseudo-random in our sense? Well, I have the audience is in the workshop on, <laughs> on this type of problems. And obviously the answer is no, because uh, if we look at, uh, you know, let's say uh, initial segment and initial segment here, we, we are adding all these numbers according to you know, the laws of addition. We see just a linear number of different entries. Why? Because you know, all the diagonals are constant. So k by k will have about 2k different numbers. So that's not good. Because remember, we want every window to be rich with many entries. OK, so that addition table is not good. So you know, what other tables do we know? I think uh, the next one we learned is the multiplication table. Uh, is this table good? Don't be shy. Yeah, okay. At least, at least some people shook their hand uh, negatively. Uh, it's the same problem as here, really. We just have to look at, at uh, geometric progressions. If I take here the numbers, I don't know, one, two, four, eight, etc., and also here, uh, then the, then uh, you know, they, there'll be only a linear number of entries in this table. So this is also bad. And uh, then, you know, after these trials failed, you immediately remember uh, John von Neumann's immortal words, those who try to uh, who try arithmetical methods for producing random digits are in a state of sin. Uh, this may be the first thing you remember. The second thing is, of course, that John von Neumann ignored completely his advice, and he was generating <laughs> big time random numbers using arithmetical means. So we'll forget about his advice also. And uh, we will generate it using these arithmetical means. Turns out that there is a wonderful theorem. Uh, it's a theorem, you know, initially in the real setting by Erdos Semeredi, and in the, in the, in the 
uh, way we need it by uh, about a decade ago by Bourguin, Katz, and Tao, saying that while each one of these tables is bad, has bad windows, if you consider them together, okay, they are good, they are pseudo-random. So in the following sense, every window will be rich either in the first or in the second, or maybe in both. And it turns out, you know, while originally we needed one table, we could use two in the, with this property, so that was very useful for us. So here every table, every window will be, will be rich. And uh, how do you use that? Well, it turns out that the, the fact that windows are rich have to do with amplifying the quality of weak random sources of, of low quality bits. I'm not going to explain it, but basically, what you are doing when you have independent sources of randomness, and uh, they each provide you with a reasonable but uh, low entropy, to boost it, you just mix addition and multiplication. You just, you know, add these two samples, multiply by a third, and sort of recurse. And each one of these steps, this richness property, really tells you that you are amplifying the entropy in your system, and you can get as close as you want to, to the uniform distribution. So that's how this works. I want to summarize uh, you know, the main points of this, uh, this talk. Uh, I would say the most important thing is this message that uh, the view of uh, computational complexity is that randomness is in the eye of the beholder. You know, it, uh, it, is, uh, it depends on the computational power or in, more generally on the test that is using the randomness. It's just as good as what you want it to be. It doesn't have to be to satisfy all randomness properties, just the thing you are using in your application. And this is a pragmatic and subjective definition of randomness. Uh, and using it, we can uh, think about different pseudo-randomness tests that just correspond directly to the applications. And uh, they capture, as we saw, many basic problems, both in math and in computer science. Uh, using this, you know, and uh, lots of work, uh, we, we know today that uh, application of, uh, applications of perfect randomness survive in, uh, in a world in which there is weak or no randomness. So in particular, again, I remind you that uh, every, you know, assuming that we have some natural hard problems, like if we, we more or less assume that P is different than NP, uh, then we know that every efficient probabilistic algorithm has a deterministic counterpart. We don't need the randomness. And uh, another point which I didn't uh, demonstrate in the talk, but it's uh, sort of amazing how powerful it is. In trying to, in working with pseudo-randomness and trying to construct pseudo-random objects, we find, uh, sometimes by luck, that they are useful for lots of other uh, you know, pseudo-random properties are, or, or objects are, are really useful beyond their original intent. And expanders, extractors, and other uh, such uh, constructions are, can be used in lots of things that have no randomness mentioned. They're just useful. So thanks.